So hello, hello everybody, uh, my name is Kamal Abdurrahman and today we're going to be talking about painting a picture of mural data. And no, it's not an image, class, image classification data set where we can look at previous artwork and identify other artists that might have painted that mural, which although it might be cool, but we're going to actually talk about how we can leverage storytelling and empathy within the data science process and understand how that can help us as data scientists in communicating with key stakeholders and ultimately how that helps us within the decision-making process. So before I begin, I actually just want to get a little bit introduction about myself. So currently, I'm a senior at Brooklyn College and I major in psychology. And throughout my undergrad, most of my education has been around understanding people and the way they interact with the world and how that world affects them. And throughout my time, it's, I took a statistics class. And I found that like, just like psychology, data was a way to learn more about people, um, the way we, our behaviors, and how we study them. And throughout college, I've had the privilege of working in really great places. I started as an artist, uh, painting murals here in New York City. And then I started interning at public agencies, uh, tech startups, and entertainment. And what I found throughout that process was that data was really a hallmark in how people made decisions. Uh, we may, maybe you have a data set on how crime rates in New York City, maybe you're trying to analyze um, ways to prevent clients from churning. And so that way, we can understand how stakeholders can learn more about their company, their organization, or even agency, and how we can better leverage that within the data science process. So what are we gonna learn today? So we're gonna cover three topics. Uh, the first one is introducing the concept of mural data. The second one is w understanding what is data storytelling. And the third one is discussing the role of empathy in data science. And so how these all come into play is understanding how does the value of context, how does the value of understanding the underlying aspects of the data help us uh, communicate with stakeholders and learning more about our companies and organizations? So what is mural data? So like I said, I used to be an artist. Um, I done projects on criminal justice, immigration, and mental health. And the way it would work is that my team and I, we would go out into communities we painted in, and we talk to people. We learn more about their lives and their stories. And we learn about, you know, sort of, we gain more information of learning about how they interact with the world. And we use that information to help us come up with our designs. As you can see here, in this first mural, we, we tackled the prison industrial complex. So we wanted to learn how, you know, privatized uh, prisons, how, how the negative effects have been having on underserved communities. And so, as you can see here, my second mural, um, Our American narrative, narrative Continues, here we can see the, s the same similar aspect of information about people's lives and how it's tied to immigration, where the, the Arab parents who might immigrate to the United States uh, go through the same struggles as their ancestors who deal with the same matter. And even with mental health, how in communities we create a, a caring environment for young children to develop into you know, growing adults that could ultimately contribute to the betterment of society. And it's really about laying that foundation as communities, families, and ultimately allowing people to grow into these positive contributors to society. So, of course, with all this information, that we get from people, whether it's about you know some personal attachment of when their parents first came to America, or you know, you know their their desire to be positive contributors of where they want to be in the world, it comes with information. And when we look back at the um, the prison industrial complex mural, here here is one example where we can look at um, the march on Memphis, Tennessee, when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was marching with sanitation workers who were on strike for, for better uh, treatment in their lives. 
in their workplace. And so we use that as a way to talk about the I am a man mantra and discussing the aspects of like wanting to be treated as equal, equal people. And so that's how we understand the aspect of taking information and ultimately boiling down into visual representations of a, um, of a mural. And so ultimately what you have is that mural data is a way of thinking through data to communicate a message. And your data set essentially is the canvas. So you're piling through numbers possibly and you're trying to find patterns through all this information and you'll, you'll compile that together to maybe create visual representations to key stakeholders and identify key aspects in which they can improve their organizations. And regardless of the type of art, artists always conveyed messages. So maybe um, we did graffiti, maybe you did murals, maybe canvases were anything, or drawing. This, the same aspect between all that was we communicated messages. We took information, we compiled it together, and we told stories of underserved communities that wanted a voice in the world. It's the same thing with data scientists, where we start to see that regardless if you are in the healthcare field, in marketing, finance, or even public service, it all boils down to how you can think like artists and convey messages to key stakeholders. And in that sense, they themselves are able to understand how can we improve you know, organizations in that retrospect. And ultimately, the way we can understand people is the same way that we can understand data. You know, as a psychologist, you have a client who comes into a meeting, you sit down with them, and you get to know them. Like, what is, how is, how is your life going? What are some issues that you're dealing with? And ultimately, you use that information to help develop recommendations to better their lives. It's the same thing with data. You have a client, maybe it's your stakeholder, maybe it's someone you're doing consulting for, and you're doing a analysis for them. That analysis is how you get to know them and you, through conversations about what they want to better themselves through um, the data analytics. And ultimately, the analysis you come up with is something that could boil down to recommendations for them. It all starts um, with how storytelling infuses life into numbers. There's a famous psychologist, his name is Daniel Kahneman. He goes, no one ever made a decision because of a number. They need a story. So you need stories, you need um, context that helps give meaning to the data, you're, the analysis you're providing for people. And Garner reported that actually 50% of data science projects fail due to bad storytelling. And that ultimately leads to a data consumption problem. So not only are you not telling the story properly, but you're also preventing your stakeholder from being able to understand what is the issue that they're dealing with and how can they better improve their um, companies if they don't know what's going on. However, um, but common mistakes in data visualization um, affects our ability to appeal to our visual per uh, perception of messages. You know, it's, na it's natural to human beings that the way we, it's better that we process information visually because we're able to see how, you know, see how changes might occur over a given time. However, from a data visualization perspective, you know, when you're understanding like, how values aren't properly represented, in the first um, uh, chart right over there. 61% doesn't look as much as it shouldn't really look compa comparably similar to 78%. Or maybe 42% shouldn't really look a bit like 22%. And even with the second one, like, we start to see like there are too many factors into play that 
it's just really hard to distinguish like one bar from another. And from the third one, not everything necessarily must be represented in this data visualization, because as we see here, like they're the hundred most active tweeters, but it's really hard to discern between one tweeter or the other. So maybe if I'm a if I'm a marketing agency and I want to look for social media influencers, I probably be hard it'd be hard for me to know uh, from which of these um, uh, tweeters that are probably most active, that are reaching out to people more, that I could actually target and help improve my business. And often, this leads to a disconnect between the data and key stakeholders. And this connection is really important because, as I mentioned before, like, stakeholders, they want to learn more how can they better their companies, how can they better their agencies. And the data scientist is the person who helps bridge that together. You are the person who's analyzing the data, who's communicating and presenting it to people who sometimes don't usually have a background in analytics. So if you have the information and you have the information seeker, then the person who's presenting the information sort of struggles um, to uh, correctly understand what's going on in the company and thus the stakeholder isn't able to make these um, corrections within the organization. And again, what happens when there is a disconnect? Information struggles to get to the key stakeholder. And most importantly, the progress of change stagnates. Um, when, again, we don't know what's going on, you really, don't, you really aren't sure what areas to improve upon. And that's sort of, um, it gets away scary because uh, maybe you want, you know, you have competition that's always improving every day. And if you're like a CEO, if you're like a product manager, how do you improve your company and keep up with everyone else when you don't even know what's going on in your own organization? So we came up with the five steps of storytelling. We have the first step which is to introduce the data's overall topic. Here is where you start to learn more about the data's background, its history, um, how has the topic been an issue over a given period of time, has there been any change, is there anything notable that we should keep in mind when we're going into the analysis itself. Here, on the second step, is where we introduce the data. Here is where we start to understand the, the limitations of the data in regards to what problem it can actually solve. So you, this will, I'll can touch on this in a little bit, but each data set you know, under any given category, whether healthcare, for example, um, healthcare itself has many different categories, or like marketing. And so you have to think to yourself, what specific part of healthcare would, be, would we be able to address given the data set that we have. And ultimately, this would come down to the possible conclusions we can make with it. And the third step is how do we identify significant or insignificant relationships? Here is where we start to understand if something, you know, is there anything notable that pops out within the data? Maybe you find a statistical significance. Um, maybe you start to find data, you start to find analysis that supports what's been going on within the historical context of the topic. Or maybe you find a date, we find analysis that goes against the current trends of the problem. And you start to think like, are we debunking a myth or are we so, sort of like agreeing upon this is what's actually go, this is what's actually going on. And for the fourth step is where we connect key points to the topic. So, by this point, you have your analysis and you have your key points. And now we have to think critically of how it relates to the problem. So if you have a, if you have a significant value, what does that mean if, you know, against the problem? Is it something that could help us solve the issue? Um, who can benefit from understanding the significance? And what, what sort of projects can we build? to implement instrumental results that will help improve 
um, your organization. And fifth is where we empathize. Here is where we start to realize how that the data itself, um, we start to think about different ways that we can solve problems and we can take the analysis and you know start putting together projects and understanding key points within not only the data set itself but within the organization that maybe the project manager needs to hire new people. Maybe we need to build a device that can help us solve this problem. Or maybe we, we just need to uh, just change up the culture. You know? So we're going to go through each step one by one with a actual data set itself. Um, we have the average wait times in the U US emergency departments. So as I'm sure anybody here can tell you, this emoji is not, it, it can't do it justice enough on how exhausted it, exhaustive it is to wait in the emergency room. Imagine you come in and you're waiting to see a doctor and you're in pain, but you're waiting an extensive amount of time. And we can see that the average wait times in the United States has been increasing. In 2003, it was actually at 46.5 minutes. And then and it increased by, by 25% to 58.1 minutes. And so given this understanding of increased wait time, we start to see how there is a ongoing issue with how the data is trending towards a bigger problem over a given time. Now we're going to introduce the data itself. Here is where we start to talk about the the type of problem within the healthcare field that the data could solve. So, as I mentioned before, healthcare has its own different subcategories, right? There's patient survival rates, there's drug development, and then there's emergency department wait times. And given our data set, it does not mention anything in regards to patient survival rates. So, and it doesn't also mention anything with regards to drug development. So essentially, any conclusions we draw from this data set cannot relate to those two subcategories. What it does talk about is emergency department wait times. So any conclusions we draw would be in relation to that specific subcategory. And this is common amongst any fields. Um, for example, public service. There is public service for criminal justice, um, whether you want to talk about mental health within, um, within prisons, um, recidivism, amongst others. So now we're going to identify significant or insignificant relationships. So here is where we highlight key points in the data and helps it helps identify patterns, and it helps patterns stick out. Um, here we can see that in the north, uh, northeastern part of the United States, that there are their top five longest areas um, within the country. Um, but within the north mid United States, they're the bottom five longest. So we start to see like there is some geographical um, difference between the areas. So that's something key to think about. What's, what's so um, important, what's so different in Montana as opposed to New York State that they're, might, they're doing something different that we might have to look into? Of course, this is only a highlighted point within the data. And so what we would have to do is that this opens up more doors to think about what specific parts of the state of Montana makes it so good that they're one of the top five lowest um, wait times within the emergency department before you're admitted. And so here is where we get to connect key points to the topic. Um, so as I mentioned before, we have the state of Montana is considered to be rural area in comparison to states like New York, which are considered urban. And 
this is actually key because uh, studies have shown that longer wait times were associated with um, the type of area you live in. So if you live in an urban area, you'll be waiting at your average around 62.4 minutes. Um, but if you're living in a rural, non-urban area, you're living at, like you're waiting around 40 minutes to be seen. And urban areas are one of the studies consider that urban areas are considered to be more populous. So in a sense, you're jamming up the ER room with more people within a given area. You have more people who are likely to visit a room. And of course, there are only so many doctors within the hospital. And, of, and this sort of becomes an issue because um, with more people entering an area, there's less attention that could be given to anyone else. So that's, what, that's been seen as a main contributor to wait times. Here is where, we begin, is where we begin to empathize. So the impact extends beyond the scope of the data. So we came up with three different recommendations um, based on analysis that we had. Say, for example, Brenda was an engineer. She saw this analysis, and she thought to herself, what can I do for the patients while they're at least waiting? Um, to be seen. Well, uh, she came up with an idea where she wants to develop a device that takes a patient's information, such as their blood type, and it's transmitted to the hospital's database. So until they get admitted to the bed, at least that sort of information is ready to go when they eventually get seen by the doctor. There's also Joe. Joe is a hospital manager. He now decided given the information he's seen, he wants to know, he wants to speak to doctors, and he wants to know what's going on on the floor every day. He wants to get their perspective of the issues that they're dealing with and understand what comes, what comes about when they're trying to treat patients, when they're trying to get one person out of bed and another person into it. All, but at still, still the same time, maintaining a quality um, service of healthcare for each of those patients. And finally, we have Rebecca. She's a top physician assistant at one of Montana's hospitals. And so she's been sent to New York to train staff at their second hospital um, about ways to manage patients in a timely, effective way. So what we see here is that we had, we had a data set, we had an analysis, and we found key points within that data. And so what we have here is that we have people from different hierarchies within the organization itself. You've had um, someone more, who has a more administrative position, someone who's um, an actual um, on the floor with the doctors. And also we have, you know, technology comes into play with this. You know, as technology, we can start to understand what sort of devices or maybe an app we can build that sort of helps us, you know, improve the process. And so ultimately, data is more than just black and white. Uh, as data scientists, we need to start thinking more of not just data in a way of here is a, here's a, here is a numerical output, here is a set of numbers, and let's come up with an analysis. What it actually is, is more than its IQ meets EQ. It's our intelligence and in being able to analyze the data as well as our intelligence to be able to put that data into context and understand what goes on under the hood in, in, one, in one perspective. And again, with context, we get to see below the surface. Um, level of our insights. One way to think of it is like the iceberg effect. Like if anyone's ever been seeing the iceberg itself, we know that on the surface it looks, might not look so big, but I'm sure if we looked underwater, those things are huge. And it's a very similar thing how we think of data science. Like yeah, you might have machine learning, 
you might have statistical analysis, and you might have data visualization. And you can flip through the data and find some key insight, but it goes beyond that. There's the idea of content masters, people who are very familiar with the field. So when we were talking about um, Joe, a hospital manager, wanting to meet with doctors. So Joe is gaining um, more information in those conversations with those doctors who have a very significant background treating patients, understanding what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, you have patterns. When we start talking about how we take information, loads of information actually, and we compile that into concise, yet effective um, understandings of the data set and the world within it. So what are the takeaways, right? Storytelling with data is an art, as much of a data science. Um, we, need to think, we need to think like artists, where we take information, convey them like, convey them into visual messages. Here is where we start to think um, more about how um, there's the fact that there's so much information in the world and when you have such a rather very large data set, you really just want to touch on the key points. Because as a stakeholder, you start to think, OK, I have this much information, x, y, z have happened. Given what, I, given what I found out about x, y, z, I can now go do this to actually help implement instrumental plans within my um, organization or, or um, company. For the second part, we have insights you derive from data um, come from more than just numerical outputs. Um, when context, content helps us understand the reason a particular outcome may, may have arisen. Um, when we were thinking back to the, um, the highlighted values on the map, when areas in Northeast were uh, very high in wait times as opposed to the north of mid-America, it just, all it did was point out a point, point out a difference in the data. It still didn't tell us why um, something's happening that certain, voice, that, set, that certain way. And what happens is that it opens up other avenues to explore within a, a data set or pr probably future projects. If anyone's ever read an academic article, where there's, there's like always a key part where it goes towards the end, which uh, introduces future implications, where we start to understand that data is a continu like the way we analyze data is always a continuous process, where, where we have one analysis, it might help us think about other ways and other types of data we might want to look into to um, help drive um, change. And ultimately, it's understanding the importance of so what. So data scientists um, <clears throat> can be thought of as advisors throughout the decision-making process. Um, when you're a person who has a, a large amount of information, you almost, in a sense, are able to take that information, analyze it, and come up with the recommendations uh, to help your company organization. And that sort of thing becomes, holds a great deal of responsibility because now you're thinking about how it may be influencing the key stakeholder who's signing off on a particular project. And that's where your responsibility, that's where the responsibility as a data scientist comes into play. Um, I think there's really one last thing to finish off with. <coughs> So as an artist, one of the things that always sticks with me is that I had a conversation one time. My, the one of the head artists I worked with, she goes to me, a mere old self will not solve world hunger, um, but if it's inspired people to want to solve that world hunger, then it's done its job. Which means that at the end of the day, a mural is really aesthetically beautiful. 
um, but the true values and its meaning and how it inspires people to want to make change. So if you're a person that goes, wow, like this is what's going on in our world, this is what's going on in our communities, I need to do something. <coughs> then it's not a shop. It's the same thing with data. A data set itself, analysis itself, will not solve the problem. But if we can, if we can tell stories with the data and create very insightful information from it, that in itself helps people understand more about the world we live in. Um, in a way, we become psychologists that give people recommendations about how can we improve people's lives. And as artists, we start to think about how, how can we paint that picture, per se, of mural data, and ultimately improve the quality of life of the world. Thank you. Any questions or? That was the project itself. Um, so the data came from the National Institute of, of National Institute of Statistics. From my understanding, it was a tree from ProPublica. Um, there's a, there's very different analysis that's done with data like that, and so of course that of course it, that could and really to other researches in healthcare. Maybe you start to think about. Um, uh, uh, do people have in health insurance? How does that affect whether um, they get admitted before others? And both from what I've seen in the data, no. So in the data set itself, there was information regarding the medical condition that someone had. Um, for, for the sake of this talk, we just focused on just wait time itself. Um, but then again, like, even when you bring up that point, it just goes to show like, other avenues we can take in analysis. Um, maybe if we looked at state and uh, medical condition, you see the, how the, that varies um, across, say, New York and uh, DC and Montana. But yeah, but definitely. And I was just wondering if it was just broken out at the state level, or did it have like the DNA or city location as well? Because that could be very interesting too. Like, um, you know, like I, you know, lots of people when they think New York, they think yeah, New York City, mm. but like the upstate New York is a very different. Right. <laughs> Um, from my, from my, from what I remember, um, there was an address. There was an address of each hospital, so if, if there we, we would be able to parse that address to get the city. But uh, the way the data was set up in this data set was that each hospital collected their own data, and so it was the value you got for each hospital was the median aggregate value for that hospital. So you can have hospital one in you know. You can have hospital one in New York, and it would have probably tw 100 patients, but you'd only get the value of that median of those 100 patients for the hospital. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.